Good afternoon and welcome. We have a, a pretty packed schedule this afternoon, and so it, it would be good if we started right on time. Uh, so first of all, I want to welcome all of you uh, who came to this event. I think it's going to be a very exciting, very interesting event. Um, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Rappaport Center. Um, we also have a group of people who are here for a workshop that will be happening over the next day and a half or so. Um, so welcome to all of you if you came from, from here, from um, Austin, or whether you came from far, far away. Um, welcome on behalf of the Rappaport Center and the Law School and the University of Texas. I want to thank um, David Kennedy and the Institute for Global Law and Policy of Harvard Law School for co-sponsoring this event, and Dan Danielson, um, whom you'll meet in a second also, um, and the program on the Corporation Law and Global Society at Northeastern University School of Law. I want to thank our scholars. I don't know if they're here. See them right now. Um, we have a number of students who work with us, law students who are our scholars, and then undergraduate students who are our interns, and they've done a ton of work to make sure this event happens um, in, in good order. Um, so thank you to them, Elizabeth, Aaron, Patrick, Julie, Sophie, and Xavier. Um, and of course, Billy Chandler, whom you may have received emails from if you came from out of town. Um, thank you, Billy and Sarah, who's also not here in any event. The, so why, um, you might ask, is the Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice organizing an event on the welfare state and on race and class in America? I mean, don't we work on human rights and foreign countries and, and all that sort of thing? Um, in fact, this event fits in pretty well um, with the way we try to approach our work here at the Rappaport Center. We've always tried to take a critical interdisciplinary look at human rights and social justice, and here we have interdisciplinary critical looks at questions, um, uh, deep questions of justice um, and human rights. Um, and tonight, in fact, both of our speakers embody the kind of approach that we hope to achieve, new ways of thinking about human rights and social justice, um, their connections, their tensions. Um, and we, like they, also focus not just on individual human rights violations, but on the structures and distributive dynamics that produce them and that get reproduced by them. Um, so more specifically, the event is part of a five-year focus at the Rappaport Center that's funded by the Ford Foundation, um, looking at human rights and inequality. Um, for three years now, roughly, we've been working on these questions um, in the context of natural resource extraction, and now we're turning to labor and the future of work. You'll probably hear a little bit more about that later on. Um, and um, that those echoes of that discussion will be, um, will be heard throughout the conversation today. So we're using this event in part to kick off a, a day and a half or so of a, of a workshop around that looks at the legal drivers of inequality, which is why uh, many of these people are here. Um, the workshop hopes, or we all hope in the course of the workshop, to find ways in which all our projects are informed by the kinds of conversations we're gonna have here today and inform each other um, and therefore hopefully converge around similar concepts, concerns, and questions. In any event, um, for tonight, the hope is that this event will stimulate a rich discussion around themes that are central to the politics of our times. Questions of exclusion and inclusion, um, questions of distribution and inequality. So thank you all for coming, and I look forward to the discussion. Um, David Kennedy now will say a couple words on behalf of the Institute for Global and Policy. Great, Paul, thanks so much. Um, so Dan, thank you very much, and it's really wonderful to be back here at Texas. The Institute for Global and Policy at Harvard that I direct has had a long relationship with the Rappaport Center. We've co-sponsored and participated together um, in a variety of different events, both here in Texas, in Cambridge, and other places around the world. Um, Dan said everything that needed to be said uh, to open an event and did so beautifully as he always does, but uh, just a word about our institute. We were founded right after the financial crisis by the Harvard Law faculty with a mandate to look at two kinds of questions. One uh, w w is to look at things in a more global way than is typical in law schools. In every country, law schools are incredibly parochial and national in their focus. And yet, over the last 20 or 30 years, many, many law faculty and students and researchers have gotten interested in international things through some specialty, international tax, international human rights, 
international aspects of antitrust, international this or that or the other thing. But the thought in 2009 was, oh dear, nobody's looking at the whole story, at the role of law broadly in the political economy um, of the world, and we ought to try to break out of our specialties uh, and do that, and also break out of the legal specialization and try to think in an interdisciplinary way about how the whole picture puts is put together and what law's role in that might be, and other methodological ways of addressing law's role in global society. Um, and secondly, with a particular focus on questions that don't, uh, weren't that visible in 2009, questions that aren't immediately of interest to the North Atlantic democracies that are the focus of the conversation, certainly um, on the New England corridor. Maybe here in Texas there are different conversations, but a, th a piece that's always been missing or underrepresented are, are voices from, about, um, and engaged with the global south, broadly understood. So our second mission is to try to think about issues of global concern that are particularly relevant to and engage people from and perspectives relevant to um, the developing world, the emerging market world, the global south, the post-colonial world, however one wants to uh, think about that. Well, inequality might be such a thing. So it might be that inequality puts these two pieces together, an aspect of global political economy, of distinct relevance not only to the global south but to the relations within the global north and the global south in the north and the relations among the great disparities in, in income, opportunity, status, wealth, and so forth in society. If we could figure out this afternoon with the help of these two gentlemen um, and, and their commentators, um, how that all works, we would have made an enormous amount of progress. So it's thrilling to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to bring our institute into dialogue with yours, Dan. Um, let me now turn it over to Karen, the co-director of the Rappaport Center, who will say something more substantive. <laughs> Um, we're doing great. Everyone's speaking very quickly because we want to get through the introductions part to get to um, you all to make it so you get to hear these, these folks. But the first speaker was Dan Brinks, who is the co-director of the Rappaport Center. Um, and um, uh, also I see Kate Taylor has come in, who's our postgraduate fellow. And so we'd like to thank her for all the work she's done in putting this together as well. Um, so it's my honor now, um, now we're turning to the panel, um, and it's my honor um, with Dan Danielson, who, um, did you wave, um, from Northeastern Law School, um, to facilitate this discussion this afternoon um, evening, slash evening, with two leading intellectuals of our time, anthropologist James Ferguson and historian Walter Johnson. Both of these professors, I have to say, like challenges. Um, you know that if you know their work, but not only did they agree to come talk with a bunch of legal scholars they don't know, um, but they also agreed to be in conversation with each other today um, and with the respondents of our choosing. So we have to say that none of us really knows how this afternoon and evening will unfold, but that's part of the excitement. Um, now, Dan already touched on this a little bit, but um, you might ask why we're in a courtroom um, in a law school with professors Ferguson and Johnson. Um, and I just want you to know there were other rooms available on campus. Um, but we wanted to house the discussion here because of our inquiry into the role of law in the production of inequality. And when Dan Brinks and I sat down with Dan Danielson and David Kennedy um, to come up with the readings for the Idea Lab that Dan mentioned, um, works by both uh, Professors Johnson and Ferguson were prominent among, those, among, among the readings, um, either for what they said about law um, or for how they affected our thinking about it, um, or both. So we wrote and asked them, um, rather than our simply discussing and debating their work, whether they might be willing to join us in person, and remarkably, they agreed, and here they are. Um, so the work of both scholars has, in fact, been important to many critical scholars in law, um, particularly those working on colonialism, race, development, international law, and international human rights. And I'll just mention three ways beyond um, what Dan Brinks already began to say in which their work is useful for the Rappaport, Sink, Rappaport Center's thinking 
about human rights and inequality. And this is going to be um, very, very brief because they're gonna fill in all the details um, now or later. So first, we've long been interested in the question of whether human rights are up for the task of tackling distributive inequalities. And as you'll see um, today, both scholars offer possibilities for new or enriched claims of distributive justice that may sit uneasily with our current rights-based focus, um, or, or rights-based vocabularies. Second, as Dan mentioned, the current focus of our work on inequality is on labor and the distributive effects of the changing organization and even displacement of work in contemporary global capitalism. And we see in the work of both authors critiques, though very different ones, of the ways in which the centrality of particular understandings of labor and production have limited our political economy perspectives and visions. And third, we attempt to do our work with an eye toward both the local and global, the global north and the global south, and interactions among and between them, um, and the multiple may ways in which they're all intertwined historically and contemporarily. And you'll see that both of our lectures tonight offer useful and provocative modes of analysis in that vein. So that's just a bit of a preview, and only with a focus on the keynote speakers. Um, we have an impressive group of respondents as well who will enrich the discussion of these and many other issues um, that will be put on the table in the next couple of hours. So I'm kind of going before, between afternoon and evening, um, and, and uh, because it's, we're going from four to seven, um, and I'll say more about that in a second. Um, I want to say, though, first that the um, respondents, um, both here for this panel and um, whom you'll meet in the second one in a bit, um, have also been up for a challenge. Um, so uh, we didn't give them the lectures of either of the people they're responding to in advance. Um, so we asked them to speak more broadly to the recent work of the speakers and to bring to the table their own very important work and insights, and you'll see that there are a lot of those as well. So, as I've already said, we're in for a bit of a long haul, so let me just tell you how the rest of the event will proceed. Um, I will introduce Jim Ferguson and his two respondents, Sharmila Rudrapa and Lucy White. Um, they will all speak, and then we will take a very brief seven-minute break um, while we set up for the next panel. And so, uh, there you can take a, uh, care of your biological needs, and folks will direct you um, how to do that, um, where, where you might do that. Um, it, how you do it is up to you. Um, when we return, um, Dan Danielson will introduce Walter Johnson as well as his respondents, Vasuki Nasaya and Shirley Thompson, who are both here on the front row. Um, and we'll then invite everyone back to the stage without a break and Dan Danielson will kick off the discussion with a question or two and invite the audience in. So, ready? Um, with no further ado, I am pleased to introduce James Ferguson, who is Susan S. and William H. Wendell Professor in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and Professor of Anthropology at Stanford University. He is one of the foremost anthropologists of development. Though his work is on Southern Africa, he has had tremendous influence in and on many parts of the world and in many different disciplines. He's written numerous articles and four very influential monographs, two of which I'll mention here. His first book, The Anti-Politics Machine, Development, Depoliticization, and Bureaucratic Power in Lesotho, which was published in 1990, is arguably the single most influential text in the historiography of development. As a sociologist colleague at UT commented to me the other day, it's a book that has launched a thousand dissertations. Professor Ferguson's most recent book is Give a Man a Fish, published in 2015. It received the 2016 Elliot P. Skinner Book Award from the Association of Africanist Anthropology, and like all of his work, has sparked a great deal of discussion and even a little bit of controversy um, for reasons you will hear and see today. Um, he will be speaking um, on I think sort of the next part of that book and some of its next phases in a, title, with, in a talk entitled Rightful Shares and the Claims of Presence, Distributive Politics Beyond Labor and Citizenship. After Professor Ferguson speaks, we'll have the good fortune 
to hear from two other outstanding colleagues, one in sociology and one in law. Sharmila Rudrapa is professor of sociology and director of the Center for Asian American Studies here at UT Austin, um, and is an affiliate of the Rappaport Center. Um, her work is on gender, race, labor, and reproductive justice, with a focus on the US and India. Professor Rudrapa is author of two books, the most recent of which is entitled Discounted Life, The Price of Global Surrogacy in India, um, which was published in 2015 and won the best book um, on Asia, transnational Asia, from the American Sociological Association. Lucy White, who we'll next hear from, um, is the Lewis A. Horvitz Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and is on the executive committee of the Harvard Center for African Studies. She works, in a, and even though she's not an affiliate faculty member because she's at another university, um, through IGLIP and through other projects, um, we've been fortunate to work on a number um, of, of topics together. Um, so it's great to have you back. Uh, uh, Lucy works in the areas of poverty law, health, environmental law, and human rights. She's published numerous influential articles and co-edited a terrific collection um, entitled Stones of Hope, African Lawyers Use Human Rights to Challenge Global Poverty. Professor White works extensively in Ghana on issues of law, rights, and distribution, and I'm guessing we'll hear a bit about that today. Um, so now, please join me in welcoming James Ferguson. Thank you, Karen, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, thanks to all of the organizers responsible for putting together this remarkable event. Um, I must say, I feel a little out of my depth in opening a conference on the role of law in the production of inequality, because I know, in fact, very little about that topic. Um, <laughs> it's not something that I would claim any expertise in, certainly, and I'm hoping to learn from all of you in the coming days. But I have been working in recent years on a different question that is, I think, in important ways related. That is the question of what I call the politics of distribution, by which I mean, most simply, the political question of who gets what and why. And the claim that I wish to make here is that labor and citizenship, long the anchors for our thinking about these questions of distribution, no longer provide an adequate way of answering them. Both in my own area of specialization in Southern Africa and across the Global South and beyond, the old answers leave out huge populations. Growing masses of unemployed and underemployed and the rapid expansion of precarious and so-called informal livelihoods challenge the old ideal of universal inclusion through integration into a stable formal sector workforce. Meanwhile, an increasingly mobile global population leaves growing numbers all over the world undocumented and thus lacking citizenship rights in their own places of work and residence. But at the same time, I argue, emergent new forms of distributive politics show the importance of different kinds of distributive claims in these times. Claims based on neither labor nor citizenship, but on what we might call, in the broadest sense, ownership on the one hand, and what I term presence on the other. I will explain these rather cryptic terms shortly. But let me start by reviewing very briefly the long-established distributive ideals focused around labor and citizenship. With respect to the labor side of the story, all across the world, a kind of meta-narrative of economic progress promised as the culmination of the development process the universalization of waged or salaried employment. A modern society was a society of jobs and job holders. That this promise has so often ended up a broken one does not diminish its attraction, as is clear in the rhetorical appeals today of politicians the world over. Jobs, 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 they say. 
but the limited ability to think beyond the promised land of jobs for all afflicts not only politicians, but scholars as well. Indeed, the so-called proper job has served for so long as a presumed norm or telos of development that we are too often left with a stunted and reactive set of categories and concepts for thinking about all the other ways in which people make their way in the world. This is perhaps why discussions of so-called precarity so often rely on residual categories of analysis. Unemployment, informal economy, non-standard employment, and so on. Concepts that render everything outside the world of jobs a kind of negative space, defined by that which it is not. There was a powerful vision implicit in the idea of an emerging developed world in which paid labor might provide the basis both of a stable livelihood and of a kind of social membership for all. As people left their pre-industrial, rural, agricultural, or pastoral livelihoods in such a conception, they would be fitted into the modern new social order precisely by having a job, that enchanted object that still provides the normal answer to the question, so what do you do? A set of gendered expectations about the so-called breadwinner and his family, the organization of time and space, the role of formal education, respectability and virtue, and contribution to the nation were rolled into this notion of the proper job. Today, as that imagined universality gradually recedes in the rearview mirror, its once dominant status begins to become visible to us as distinctive, perhaps even strange. As Guy Standing once memorably put it, the 20th century, in retrospect, now appears as what he called the century of laboring man, a time when the life way of what had been a small fraction of the population, the stabilized urban working class, became quite suddenly and somehow for many convincingly projected as the future of all. And if the century of laboring man is, as Standing argues, at an end, it is not because stable waged and salaried labor is disappearing in any absolute sense, but because it is losing its plausibility as the universal solution, the obvious telos of a worldwide developmental process. Whether due to the globalization of supply chains and labor markets that undercuts established working classes, the persistent structural employment and casualization induced by neoliberal restructuring and austerity, or the recent and looming technological developments that threaten to eliminate or drastically reduce whole categories of paid labor, increasingly including white collar office work, the old transition story no longer convinces. One effect of this lost conviction is the apparently worldwide contemporary anxiety about jobs and the social and economic stability they were long expected to anchor. The anxiety springs from a perception that increasing proportions of the population across much of the world can no longer rely upon or even plausibly hope for the sort of stable waged or salaried labor that has long counted as a proper job. And this worry is not confined to poor countries where whole populations appear as surplus to the needs of capital. In rich industrialized countries too, the loss of manufacturing jobs and general economic insecurity also raise the specter of what Michael Denning has termed wageless life. Some of this anxiety is about raw unemployment but even more pervasive is the sense of insecurity and uncertainty evoked by the now widespread term precarious, an adjective that today finds surprisingly broad application across regions and social classes. The term's wide application is surely simply mistaken if it is meant to suggest a single shared set of substantive economic conditions as if a freelance computer programmer in Silicon Valley 
and a shack-dwelling casual laborer in Lusaka are somehow part of the same unitary so-called precariat. But for my purposes here, what is significant about precarity is the way that it surfaces a set of issues that go far beyond purely economic ones. Just as jobs were never only about money, the anxiety I reference here is not just about the loss of income or the threat of falling into absolute poverty, but also about the wider implications of increasing casualization, subcontracting, freelancing, improvising, all the so-called flexibility, uncertainty, and short-termism that so undermines the real or imagined certainties and temporalities of the old breadwinner world. The anxiety is thus not just about paychecks, but equally about issues of identity, gender and family, national membership, and so on, that were so long anchored by the social ideal of the proper job. In the political domain, the nation state has long provided the same sort of promise of stability that the proper job was supposed to offer in the economic domain. A legally authorized political membership, in theory at least, underpinned a set of explicit and universal rights and obligations. And this too helped provide the answer to that central question of distributive politics. Who gets what and why? If income, in labor terms, was seen as a reward for work, there always remained the question of all those who did not, in those terms, work. That is, those unable to work or those whose work was not paid. Society being composed not of individuals, but of domestic groups, often understood in highly idealized terms as families, legitimate dependence was part of the distributive story. In this old story, children, old people, and often reproductive women as well, were styled as legitimate dependents, dependent upon the so-called worker, the breadwinner, the head of household. But there were also others unable to work due to disability, for instance, or the unemployment produced by the unpredictable vacillations of the business cycle. And here, the nation state steps into the spotlight, especially in the form of so-called welfare states that, where they existed, offered a different kind of legitimate dependence in the form of direct social payments to the poor and a so-called social safety net. Social assistance, perhaps the purest instance of direct state intervention into distributive outcomes, here was pegged directly to the two anchors of distributive politics that I have identified. First, it was generally available not to able-bodied male workers, but specifically to so-called dependents, that is, children, the elderly, the disabled, the reproductive woman, a kind of photographic negative of the laboring man, the breadwinner. And it was available, again, nearly always only to citizens as a kind of solidarity appropriately extended only to those within the charmed circle of national membership. My argument here, to put it in a highly condensed form, is that this whole way of thinking about distribution has less and less purchase today, both in southern Africa and in much of the rest of the world, as increasing proportions of people fall out of the labor and the citizenship frames of inclusion. These include the surging new urban masses who don't gain their livelihoods either from working the land, they are no longer peasants, or by selling their labor, they cannot become in that sense workers, but instead pursue what I have termed distributive livelihoods, that is livelihoods that depend not on selling one's labor but on accessing the income streams of others via social or political claims. They also include those who, with or without access to paid labor, are unable to access citizenship-based forms of distribution, including social protection, due to migration and the associated lack of documents. So-called illegals, 
who in southern Africa and elsewhere comprise an increasingly large share of the poor, but who as residents but not citizens lack political rights and distributive entitlements alike. Given these increasingly hard to ignore gaps in the world's systems of distributive allocation, I wish to pose the question of what other grounds or legitimate principles or political arguments beyond those rooted in labor and citizenship are available to support new sorts of distributive claims. What new ways are emerging for answering the questions, who gets what and why? Here, I point to two broad areas of emergence. One, what I call claims of ownership, comes from my recent work in the book uh, that Karen kindly referred to, Give a Man a Fish. The other, involving the claims of what I call presence, is something I am now trying to work out in a still in progress new paper, brief excerpts from which I will include in what follows. With respect to what I'm calling ownership, I begin by observing that even those who are partly or wholly excluded from the world of productive labor may still make strong distributive claims by styling themselves as members of a collectivity understood as a rightful or ultimate owner. Marxism, with its labor theory of value and its fundamental understanding of the oppressed as workers, has always struggled with the politics of the non-worker, the so-called lumpen masses excluded from the putatively revolutionary class of wage laborers. But I suggest in the book that we are in fact heir to a rich set of alternative left traditions that may have more to offer to those excluded from a role in the production system. The anarcho-communist Peter Kropotkin, for instance, always insisted on starting with universal claims of distribution and a notion of distributive justice ultimately rooted in societal membership and not just labor. Where does our vast wealth come from, he asked. Why are we so much more productive than our great grandparents? We are not better people than they were. We certainly do not work harder. Instead, we are able to produce vast riches they could not have dreamt of, only thanks to a vast worldwide industrial apparatus of production, an apparatus built up through generations of work sacrifice and invention across centuries and even millennia of human history in a process that generated massive suffering for millions all across the globe. And to whom does this vast wealth producing apparatus really belong? Surely not only to the corporate stockholders who now outrageously claim to own it outright, but to the descendants of all those who worked and imagined and suffered and bled to create it. In short, to all of us. The whole system of production in this conception must be regarded as a collective inheritance. And from this universal claim of common ownership, Kropotkin derives a universal distributive claim. Surely, at least some portion of the entire output must be due to each and every one of the rightful owners of the apparatus of production. Everyone, that is, must receive a share. Note that it is not the worker as worker whose claims are prioritized here, but the member of society, the inheritor of a great common estate in which each and every one of us has a share. It is not just labor that founds that inheritance in this view, but also things like suffering, bloodshed, ingenuity, and shared experience. It is therefore the entire society that is the source of value. And it is all members of that society, and not only those currently employed as workers, who, as inheritors and co-owners of the whole, are entitled to a rightful share of society's proceeds. 
Such arguments, I have argued, are not only of academic interest. As I show in Give a Man a Fish, remarkably similar arguments have been put forward by advocates for Namibia's Basic Income Grant Coalition, who propose that each and every Namibian should be entitled to a monthly cash payment precisely because they, as the nation's citizens, are the real owners of the country and its substantial mineral wealth, and therefore ought, in their words, to share in the country's wealth. Receipt of a modest monthly state payment in these arguments is rendered simply as the receipt of a share that is properly due to an owner. The most basic citizenship right is thus understood not as the right to vote, but as the right to partake in the wealth of the nation. Direct grants from the state in this understanding need not bring with them the shame or stigma of receiving charity or getting a handout. In receiving a rightful share, Namibian citizens in this conception are simply partaking in the wealth that rightly belongs to the whole nation. And in doing so, they, as rightful co-owners of that wealth, are not receiving a gift or being offered help. They are claiming what is already rightfully their own, a rightful share. But such arguments about shares and sharing, however powerful, are founded upon their own form of exclusion insofar as they are based on membership in a bounded collectivity, the nation, institutionally represented by the state. And this is linked to that second set of problems I identified at the start. In a highly mobile world, many of the poorest members of many national populations today are those who lack most completely the protections offered by the state, since they are non-citizens. This raises a key question. On what basis, other than shared national membership, might a distributive obligation, what I think of as an obligation to share, rest? I try to begin to address this question in that new paper I referenced via an argument about what I call presence. Here, I very briefly summarize one part of that paper. Reviewing the substantial anthropological literature on sharing, I find something quite general about the obligation to share. In the most basic possible terms, I observe that we find such an obligation specifically when the person whose claim to a share might or might not be honored is both first one of us, what I call the attribute of membership, and second, here among us, what I call the attribute of presence. Okay, so there's two elements to this standing that would grant one that um, obligation to a share. Being first one of us, the attribute of membership. Second, being here among us, the attribute of presence. And my observation here is that one of these attributes without the other may have some force but never the full force that comes with both membership and presence. In the modern West, we are familiar with the idea that at least some minimal obligations are owed toward fellow members of, as we say, our own society. That is, those who are both co-members of the abstract membership set that is the nation and co-present in the geographical space we call the country toward those who are in this way both members, one of us, and present, here among us, the fact of a certain kind of social obligation is clear, even if the specific forms it should take are not. Indeed, we sometimes regard these obligations to be of a similar kind, if of less intensity and moral depth, as those owed to members of our own families. In contrast to such relatively strong obligation, we may note the weakness, both of presence without membership, which yields only such fairly feeble forms of obligation toward physically proximate non-nationals as asylum proceedings, and of membership without presence, 
as when membership in humanity, for instance, functioning as a kind of analogical extension of the nation, is urgently assisted, uh, urgently asserted for distant and foreign others, usually not to much effect. This distinction between criteria of membership and those of presence is, I think, clarifying. But a quick turn to Southern Africa reveals how these two principles may be brought together in a more dynamic way than we in the West are used to, as presence and membership there often sit in a much more fluid relationship. In European societies, blood and soil have long served as principles of exclusion, such that one may be expelled or excluded either for having the wrong descent or for being born in the wrong place. But Southern African societies are in the long durée, if not always at present, historically disinclined to kick out foreigners and highly sophisticated at devising means for incorporating them as what anthropologists of Africa call wealth in people. And in the service of securing such wealth, they have traditionally had a more supple and lively conception of how belonging may be linked to both territory, including soil, and bodily substances, including blood. Over time, foreigners have often been held to become durably attached to a place through things like labor, as their sweat mingles with the soil, and suffering, as shared suffering and spilled blood creates a spiritual unity rooted in the lived experience of co-dwelling. Here, it is not juridical citizenship that is at issue, where you were born, who your parents were, but the material entailments of shared physical presence, suffering through the same drought, sweating into the same soil. Being here, in this long political tradition, counts for a lot. And over time, such physical presence actually becomes both a kind of membership and an identity of substance. A neighbor is therefore a position from which strong claims can emerge. A gifted young Zambian ethnographer, Patience Mususa, has recently given a fine example of this from the Zambian Copper Belt. Having purchased for her own use a fixer-upper house in an urban neighborhood of Luantia, Mususa was soon approached by a neighborhood man who asked if he and his family might move into a spare room at the back of her property on the understanding that his wife would, in exchange, serve as a domestic worker. The ethnographer politely declined and explained that she did not need a domestic worker and did not intend to rent out the room. But when she moved in a few weeks later, she found out that the family had simply moved into the room. Her outrage was quickly checked, though, by the reactions of her neighbors, who asked just what then she did intend to do with that room. In their eyes, she realized, and I quote, to have an unoccupied building would have been too selfish indeed, and she reluctantly let the family stay. In a similar incident, she reported finding one day, upon her return home from work, two strange women helping themselves to some vegetables she had planted in her back garden. Unperturbed, the women cheerfully shouted, we are just stealing some vegetables from your garden. <laughs> Surely, the ethnographer reflected, living alone, I could not have eaten all the vegetables in the garden. Such helpings, as she calls them, were not only common, they were, in a real way, as she puts it, deemed acceptable. As anthropologist Thomas Bidlock has rightly insisted, among the most important modalities of sharing must be reckoned the practice of, as he puts it, refraining from interfering with someone who is about to take something. This is the logic of what anthropologists call demand sharing, and the rightfulness of the share is here rooted precisely in the simple presence of adjacency, the fact of being here, the status of being a neighbor. Yet the power of this social and political logic of presence, I suggest, remains significantly underanalyzed 
even as what I have called the membership principle, one of us, is both explicitly acknowledged in law as citizenship and endlessly subject to critical analysis as the politics of identity, the presence principle here among us has largely remained at the level of common sense. We have not yet fully realized either how central it is to enabling actual feelings of social obligation or how richly constructed is the apparently self-evident condition of being present, of being here. What might be gained then from a conceptual and political reworking of the idea of presence as the basis for a modern day politics of sharing? Answering this question poses the challenge of moving from the sort of liber literal face-to-face -face presence that we see in that Copper Belt neighborhood to a reworked and scaled up concept more suitable to modern distributive politics. An obligation to share is most readily grasped at the micro level of personal interaction. We have a harder time imagining how it might apply to larger scales. But why is this? And why do we so easily imagine membership, in contrast, as being capable of scaled up to hundreds of millions of people, as in the idea of national citizenship uniting people in a way that is analogous to membership in a family? The task here, as I see it, is to develop a better sense of what a similarly scaled up conception of presence might look like and to identify modes of distributive politics that might be able to harness the claims of presence to press for specific distributive claims. Ways of insisting that the fact of being here, citizen or not, must be made to have more bearing on that old question of who gets what and why. In conclusion, let me emphasize that I acknowledge that the modes of making distributive claims that I have discussed here remain marginal to a world where the old constructs of labor and citizenship continue to dominate the conceptual landscape of distributive politics. But I would also insist that the forms of distribution I have identified must be understood as emergent realities rather than utopian proposals. Universalistic payments based on the idea of popular ownership, for instance, are not unknown. The Alaska Permanent Fund, for instance, makes all legal residents of Alaska shareholders in a portion of the wealth produced by oil production there. And residents receive an annual dividend check based not on their participation in production, but their legal status as state residents, that is, as owners. New social protection programs in several countries also link state-owned mineral resources directly to social entitlements, such as pensions and child care grants. More broadly, the cash transfer schemes that have proliferated all across the global south in recent years are, it is true, still mostly conceived in a depoliticized social assistance frame. But in the book, I suggest drawing on Southern African experience that they may also be helping to lay the groundwork for new sorts of distributive politics that might help move social payments away from the, the old grounds of charity and help for the helpless and toward new conceptions that do in fact move in the direction of the rightful share. As for presence, here too my approach is to track real developments on the ground not to propose some imaginary pie in the sky. In fact, the modern politics of state service delivery reveal the very real power of social claims based on presence. As Partha Chatterjee once pointed out, practical imperatives of governance often mean that legal certainties of citizenship and rights give way to other logics entailed in the day-to-day -day management and administration of populations, which, as he put it, involves less the representation of citizens than the government of denizens. Which children should attend school? Who gets vaccinated for measles? Who gets toilets? The answers often proceed not according to a logic of right, 
but of practicality. Well, but do we want undocumented kids not to be in school? What would they do then, and with what consequences? Do we really want to exclude a huge chunk of the population from our vaccination campaigns? Not legal abstractions, but brute sociological and immunological facts give the answers to such questions. Certain services must, for practical as much as ethical reasons, be extended not to whoever is an authorized member, but to whoever is here. And all over the world, new forms of both political assertion and pragmatic accommodation draw their force not from the claims of citizenship, but those of presence. The problems of government that they present involve less adjudicating the rights belonging to members than coping with the material demands of what we might term adjacency. Finally, I want to emphasize that it is not a matter of whether or not we should have new modes of distribution. The great and growing masses of people who lack both access to land and regular wage labor and the protections of legal citizenship are not going to meekly curl up in a corner and die. They will press their distributive claims using whatever channels and levers are available to them. If the claims of labor and citizenship are not available to them, they will find other grounds for making distributive claims. And we will have to come to terms with new ways of thinking and new sorts of arguments. Arguments that will disrupt our long established ways of answering that old question, who gets what and why? Thank you, Professor Ferguson. That was wonderful. Um, it took me back to my graduate school days when I used to sit with Eric Olin Wright and talk about basic incomes. So it's just been wonderful going through this in a much more substantive uh, manner that I did with Eric Olin Wright back in the day. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, because I guess I have about seven to ten minutes, uh, I'm going to jump straight into my comments. Um, and. Given that you're talking about distribution or redistribution, if you will, I want to focus on three other R's, and that is recognition, which always goes with questions of distribution, and that seems like an old hat at some level, reparations, and reserves. By that, I mean bioreserves. Right? Reserves. Bioreserves. Reserves, okay. yes. Uh, who gets what and why is a question that you posed. And even in families, I'm not even thinking about societies, I'm not thinking about citizens, even within families, it's a question of who gets what and why. Um, very often the notion of a male uh, breadwinner in the family who brings money to the family had women independent positions, which at some level leads women um, especially Marxist feminists in the late 60s and 70s, uh, to be thinking about wage transfers for home work, right? I'm thinking about the International Wages for Housework campaign started in Italy in 1972. Uh, Silvia Federici, who visit us, visited us a while ago, right, who also starts, for example, wages for housework groups in the US. The problem they point out to at some level, which is also what you're pointing out to here, is it's not about transferring patriarchal responsibility for maintaining the household uh, from the working waged husband and father within the nuclear family to the new man, the state, but it's also to expand possibilities for women, right, which they were not able to do under earlier forms of patriarchal control. So let me read some of the campaign where they say, Wages for housework for all women means the power to decide whether or not we want to have children. So they tie it into reproductive justice. The power to demand services to cut down housework, and this means, first of all, free daycare. Centers opened all day long and in our neighborhood. The power to take a vacation from housework, including from our children. We need that very often. The power to refuse the double shift of a second job, which is now our only alternative to working for nothing. 
the power to demand free medical care, including free childbirth, and methods of contraception that don't ruin our bodies and our sexuality as well. At some level, you're asking for cash transfers would be that women are not just achieving all of this within households, but hopefully those are not workers anymore. Men too can actually achieve some of this, right? It's, it's not just about economic justice, but it's about reproductive justice, just in these far more broad ways. Um, so that was one point I wanted to make. Uh, recognition, the other kind of recognition that I wanted to point to is even co-presence or presence doesn't necessarily lead to any kind of recognition. I'm thinking, for example, Muslims, uh, Muslim communities in Assam, right next to Bangladesh and India, for example. The Indian state, especially the ultra-right-wing Indian state, constantly marks these individuals as Bangladeshis, and then the point then becomes the production of documentation to prove that you're Indian, right? Um, so the presence, the historical presence of these people doesn't seem to matter. It becomes a political question in terms of proving and attaining that kind of recognition, uh, including the documentation. Birth certificates, if you don't have birth certificates, do you have land records? If you don't, do you have some kind of labor contracts to show, so on and so forth. So presence itself at some level is predicated perhaps on an understanding of labor. Uh, either in the past or at the present moment, right? Um, the second R that I had, these were the first two R's, are well, the first one was recognition uh, within households, but even within communities in terms of presence, co-presence. The second R that I had listed here was uh, reparations. Reparations, for example, for indigenous, indigenous lands, or for example, slavery. Right? Uh, how would that work within this model? Uh, for example, you know, slave owners receive reparations for loss of property when slavery ends, but former slaves don't necessarily receive anything. Right? So how does that work within this context uh, of distribution? How does reparations fit in? And the third I'm thinking about is reserves, really bio-reserves, the third R that I had on my list. And I'm thinking about something like the Yasuni National Park in Ecuador. In 1998, uh, UNESCO declares the Yasuni region as a wild heritage site worthy of international protection because of very high biodiversity and species endemism, right? But this region at some level is also cursed with 20% of Ecuador's total fossil fuel deposits. So at some level then Ecuador needs to bear the burden of preserving this bioreserve for all of humanity versus harvesting that oil, right? And in that sense then who gets to pay for that while at some level you could say humanity at large benefits from this, right? How might indigenous people, and the second part to this is, I'm again coming back to labor. How might indigenous peoples who live in these bioreserves have labored to maintain biodiversity? Very often, biodiversity simply doesn't arise out of thin air, but it's actually an act of labor, of uh, husbanding the land, if you will, um, you know, in a very traditional way of thinking about this. Uh, so there's actually labor that has gone into it as well. So how do we think through this outside of labor? Um, because it would mean a massive misrecognition of the kind of work that has gone in. Some of it compensated, a lot of it, um, what shall I say, um, stolen, <laughs> right? How does that fit into this question uh, of distribution uh, that you pose? Which I think is just such a fantastic idea. Uh, but I just wanted to end my comments there and allow others, uh, Lucy, to take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen and Dan. And um, thank you, Professor Ferguson, for your endlessly nuanced and inspiring comments. I, I 
really moved by what you said. Um, my um, response and my thinking is really based on prior work that you've done, particularly the early work on presence and the um, uh, book that you've written. Um, it seems that you've, um, you basically are, are calling for a new politics that's built on three moves, a normative move, an ethnographic observation, and several policy observations. The normative move is a revaluing of both dependency and non-waged work uh, for a variety of reasons. The ethnographic observation is that if you look closely at precarious people, they're actually doing the work, and you use that repeatedly, of survivalist improvisation or continual di distribution outside of the eye of those who value waged work. And the policy observations are three, that cash transfers are proliferating across the global south, that there are efforts afoot to expand those policies into a basic income, and that those efforts are happening at the same time as both calls for na national resource distribution to people and also emerging movements for social goods at the, at the urban and urban areas. Um, and all of this you add up, you, you, you pull together to call for a new politics of presence that involves distribution of the, what's proper and what's right on the basis of what you've talked about today, a uh, uh, very, uh, very challenging uh, concept to scale up, of course. Um, I want to make very briefly a couple of remarks about each one of the uh, revaluations that you are engaged in before going on to ask a more general question about value and law. Um, first of all, with respect <coughs> to the revaluation of dependency. You seem to, you give a lot of different um, examples of dependency being fluid, uh, structured in nuanced ways by different forms of sociality, sociality not necessarily rigidly hierarchical, et cetera, et cetera, as you get outside of the industrial capitalist schema. Um, but what I wanna ask though, is whether you make it sound too easy. And if you take into account how structured subordination uh, that takes place across the board, across the globe, whether even within the whatever systems you scale up, you're gonna have the problem of continued, exploited, ex oppressive and <coughs> violent dependency. I think you can't slip off of that so easily and just having, having done work in the US in the bureaucratic income distribution system, I saw terrible violence against African American people. The second theme with respect to the revaluing and through the ethnographic lens, distributionism as a form of activity. What's interesting to me is you um, rhetorically anyway characterize it repeatedly as work in order to revalue it. And I'm wondering if you do that, whether that's in tension with your trying to revalue dependency. And I'm just wondering how work and dependency mesh together and to articulate. And I'm particularly thinking that because when you talk about the rightful share in uh, Give a Man a Fish, you talk about the claimant um, have or being valued for actively and even aggressively claiming and what about the dependent <laughs> who may not be in a position to actively or aggressively claim? Is that a less valued claimant in the uh, politics of presence? Um, and, and finally, the policy move toward a basic income for all the idea of a universal, adequate, per capita income for everyone as the policy um, realization that we may be moving toward at least uh, in Give a Man a Fish. Um, who could be against it? It would, it, it would free up waged workers from op oppressive jobs. It would give everyone the chance to care for their families, their communities. It would capitalize all sorts of survivalist improvisation. It would give people an economic base for social movement and it would empower women. It would um, 
difficult ground under the politics of presence and revalue dependency and absorb the chronically unemployed. Like, who could be against it? And um, all I have to say here is that the big problem, just as a matter of policy, is that it could result in legitimating the withdrawal of redistribution from public goods. And I think for many reasons, you may say that adjacency entitles people to vaccinations and schools and whatnot, but all of that costs more money than you're gonna be able to re-aggregate through, I don't know how. Um, it's simply, you, you can't capitalize those things through the sort of money you can tax out of transfers. You're gonna have to have another form of distribution that happens at the same time and as a matter of policy, to inter-articulate those is a complicated thing. And I think you need to not forget that policy complexity, and I don't really think we have any good models for that around. The closest I could think of was Obamacare, which was subsidizing both individuals and systems at the same time. But I want to um, move at this point um, to the question that I ended up with, which is where is the law in your thinking? And the only reason I ask that is you seem to be very intrigued by value and what value is and does, what is the value that should be divided, what's the gain that will be divided up around the campfire. And I think you move through several different ideas here. I mean, one thing is natural resources. The gold is the value, and that's what the oil in Alaska is the value that should be shared. You talk about a private windfall, a person finding oil on her private property. This, he believes, is another kind of value that should be shared. You talk about the magic, that's your word, of highly capitalized, highly automated, low labor firms that are producing huge, huge profits. That value should be shared. You talk about the great wealth from hedge funds and cross-border capital flows that don't seem to be backed up by any gold or any product production at all, this wealth should be shared. And we talk about, you even talk about tits and mother love, the ultimate fount of all value. And you suggest that that value is being shared and should be shared. Um, and then you talk about the collective action of social creativity, the inheritance of bloodshed and suffering and survivalist improvisation, all those kinds of values should be shared, and then ask the question whether distributionism can itself create value, that circulation can create value, but you stop here because you see it as a chicken and egg problem and you don't want to get caught up there. And it kind of leaves the question whether you can tell the dancer from the dance, or whether they're one. So the question here about raises a question about the creation of value as well as its distribution. And that's where I think that the law comes in because there's a process of the hunters getting the game and running into the ends of the, the, the boundaries of the game reserves as well as the, they're dividing it up at the campfire. And here I think we can go back through your examples and look to the law. The law that was discovered on the farmer's property is only the farmers because of a whole web of law that divides up the land and the earth from the center of the earth through the sky. Um, you can even think in terms of national wealth. Nas Ghana's national oil wealth just got hugely increased because of a decision by the International Maritime Court about tribunal about the nature of the um, continental shelf vis-a-vis -vis Ivory Coast. And then they got a big uh, contract with ExxonMobil that opens up a whole new world of oil that would never have been opened up. Even the milk that nurtures babies is watered down with Nestle powder because of ta international tax law that governs, <laughs> international law that governs health and safety and international marketing. Not to mention the fact that it is infected too often by HIV because mothers don't have legal access to the drugs that would prevent or control that transmission. Um, the tech, the obviously, the production of value through technology and financial flows is configured by 
many laws and regulations of international uh, intellectual property, banking, tax, the global nexus of nation, national laws that go with it, and survivalist improvisation is itself configured by law when a cop shoots a person for begging in a high-end tourist zone. So all this is to say that the creation of value as well as the distribution of value is what's so important to get our heads around when we think about equality. And that creation of value as well as the distribution has everything to do with law. So it's not a question of, of trying to figure out what's being hidden, but to find, trying to figure out what's being made and remade, often by rules that aren't even noticed, and mapping those rules. Um, and as cash transfers get called redistributional without a deep grappling with the ways that the law configures um, inequality, um, then we're marshalling law to divide up what appears to be gold in what will be a losing game. <laughs>